It is so good being here. And you see that um, they get these little stools for me because I'm so tall. And, uh, <laughs> but it is an honor to be here um, as usual at this place, at this library, where we have seen so many people come through and, um, and make Philadelphia feel really good. Um, I want to begin by reading a stanza from Between the World and Me by Richard Wright. And one morning, while in the woods, I stumble suddenly upon the thing, stumble upon it in a grassy clearing guarded by scaly oaks and elms and the sooty details of the scene rose, thrusting themselves between the world and me. The title of our dear brother's uh, book. Woke up this morning with my eyes on Richard Wright. I say woke up this morning with my eyes on Jimmy Baldwin. Woke up this morning with my eyes on Amiri Baraka. Woke up this morning with my eyes on Tana Hesey Coates. Gonna live, gonna love, gonna resist just like them. In this country, where history, history stretches in aristocratic silence, a young writer has come at the beginning of the 21st century, carrying the quiet urgency of a star, and the country is not the same. I say, who is this man who sang down the lids of the country against peacock catastrophes? I say, I say, who is this man always punctual with his tongue, his eyes, his heart, his hands? hands? I say, I say, who is this man who found memory beneath our doors, who performed surgery on our national memory, who began to ask questions as he resurrected summer on our American landscape, as he anointed our eyes with the tapestry of young black breaths? Behold, this man questioning the flesh of American intellect with words and history and information and love. Behold this writer, this man, this husband, this father, this son, this grandson speaking to our history and history whose hands are larger than the sea. He asked, whose hands are larger than the sea, whose eyes are larger than the stars, whose color is more important to God. Behold, this writer with a miracle on his tongue saying, step inside, I say step inside, Africans, whites, step inside, blacks and Chicanos and Puerto Ricans, step inside, Muslims and Jews, step inside, Americans and Asians and transgenders and gays and lesbians, step inside. We are all wild time here. Amu muen mi amor, rosemary, amu muen mi amor, watermelon seeds, peppermint and garlic with roses caught in our throats, our hands anointed with eyes, our legs greet themselves at this American door. Step inside, step inside, I say step inside, amu muen mi amor. Our bones join at the spine, our blue midnight breaths. I say, I say, I say what Franz Fanon said, what is, needed to, what is needed is to hold oneself like a sliver to the heart of the world, to interrupt, if necessary, the rhythm of the world, to upset, if necessary, the chain of command, but ellipses to stand up to the world. I do battle for the creation of a human world that is a world of reciprocal recognition. And I say, and I say, and I say, and I say, we hear you, my dear brother, doing battle for a human world. I say, I say, I say, I say, we hear you singing the morning wind and becoming the wind. I, I say, I say, you, young man, coming to us, warrior clear, your intellect kissing our spines. We see your solitary eye demanding dignity and change. You, Ta Nahisi Coates, you, 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 Ta Nahisi Coates, you, weaver of words, threading silver and gold into our veins. I say, I say, I say, behold and welcome Ta Nahisa Coates this Friday night in Philadelphia. Woke up this morning with my eyes on you, 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 you. Woke up this morning with my eyes on Ta Nahisa Coates. Woke up this morning with my eyes on you, 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 you,
gonna love, gonna resist, just like you, 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 who, you, 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 you. Thank you. Y'all can go home. That was the show. That was the show. Well, how about that introduction? Yeah. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Tracy Matasek. It's my great pleasure to be here with all of you tonight. And uh, Tallahassee, <coughs> I just want to thank you for advancing the conversation about race in a way that I don't think anyone has done in quite a long time. And so um, we're glad that you're here with us tonight. We have a lot to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> begin by talking about the book, Between the World and Me. You wrote it as a letter to your son, and it's a letter of love, of admonishment, of history, of nostalgia. Um, why did you decide to write the letter, or write the book in the form of a letter? Well, um, before I do that, I, um, this is Philadelphia where my dad is from, and as it happens, there are a number of people uh, who are here, um, who I have to thank. Absolutely. I'm so sorry, I take time out for this. <laughs> first things um, and, first. And forgive me if I miss anybody, it was not, you know, I didn't, I didn't mean to do it. Um, first of all, uh, this book would not be possible without Dr. Mabel Jones. Are you here, Dr. Jones, anywhere? Okay, there you are, thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and Jen, are you here, is Jen here? Hi Jen, okay. With the baby. And Nina, are you here? Is Nina here? Oh my God, there's Nina in the back. Thank you. <laughs> Nina's what, 15, 16 years old, so she won't stand up. She's a teenager, so she doesn't want to be embarrassed. <laughs> I um, understand. The, these are uh, uh, important people in, in your community. Um, if you have any uh, love for this book, um, you have to have uh, love for that family right there. That is the family of Prince Jones. Um, this book would not. <clears throat> Um, well, you know, a Prince Jones was, was murdered uh, 15 years ago, um, and I didn't, I hadn't had much experience with death at that point. Um, I would not, you know, over-exaggerate my, my relationship with Prince. Uh, he was um, a, a brother who, you know, in, in the parlance of the time, you know, I would, I would say I had love for, a lot of love for Prince. Um, and he was just killed in the worst possible way, and you can you know, hear, hear it in the book. Um, I, I came to uh, the home of Dr. Jones uh, some 14 years later, and shockingly, she agreed to speak with me to talk about it. Um, because I would have totally, totally understood uh, had she just slammed the door in my face and said, you know, no, I, I, want, I want nothing to do with this. Um, it's just that much pain, but she didn't do that. She opened her life to me, um, she talked to me, uh, and this book simply is not possible with, without that sort of sacrifice. So whatever love you have for this book, you have to have love uh, for the folks here in your community um, who are willing to share and, and make this book possible and, and, and really work for a day when uh, something like you know, what happened to Prince won't happen again. So I just wanted to make sure I thank them. Um, also, um, I, I, I think, uh, is my Aunt Barbara and Aunt Tapia, are you guys here anywhere? You don't have to stand up, you just gotta raise your hands. <laughs> Okay, all right, I'm not gonna make you stand up, Aunt Barbara. Um, my Aunt Barbara and Aunt Tabby here, Hope, are you here? Is Hope, Hope here? My cousin Hope, she, okay, all right, that's okay. Um, <laughs> that's okay, um, thank you anyway, Hope. Um, <laughs> um, uh, my Aunt Barbara and Aunt Tabby here, nothing is more important than family, um, and I have memories of going down to the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, where my people were enslaved, um, and and I, I think about it all the time where my family is from, um, but I don't, you know, particularly have memories of enslavement, obviously. What I have memories of is waffles and pancakes, <laughs> <laughs> which I love. My Aunt Tavia and my Aunt Barbara would, would make them for me, and they are here tonight, and I'm so happy that they're here. Um, the other person, and again, if I missed anybody, please, you know, forgive me. Um, the other person is, is, is my friend Joel Diaz Porter, who's, who's uh, seated over here. You can stand, brother. You can stand. Uh, <laughs> and Joel is, um, I mean, Sister Sonia started with the poem from Richard Wright. Joel introduced me to that poem. 
I wouldn't know about that poem if it was. I would, I would never have, you know, read the poem Between the World and Me, uh, along with, you know, much of the poetry that's quoted in this book, much of the poetry um, I, I've talked about. Um, Joel is, is, is so special because he's had uh, a hand in uh, the lives of so many great writers. I'm lucky enough to be nominated for the National Book Award uh, this year for nonfiction. But the other person who's nominated with me is Terrence Hayes, who Joel was also a mentor too. You know, in, in DC, and Joel is obviously in his own right a, a, a great poet, but just a, a, a scholar, man, just a scholar. And this was a brother who I met when I was, you know, 17 years old, about to turn 18, and really took me under his, under his wing, argued with me the way my dad used to argue with me, <laughs> and just gave me an education in literature. And it's, um, it's right there in that book. And I'm sorry, after all those thank yous, I forgot what your question was. <laughs> We gotta take care of first things first. Okay, all so, right. So the book is written in the. Form oh yes, of the letter. letter. That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that. You asked me why I did it, right? Yes. Why in the okay. form of a letter to your son? Um, well, I, I wish I had um, something better to say than what, what I'm about to say. The fact of the matter is, I tried to write between the world and me several times, and it just, you know, it, it was kind of not working. Um, the the letter is really a literary device. You know, um, there is nothing in that book that you know had any reason to be a letter to my son, because everything that's in the book I'd already told him, we'd already talked about. There's no new information for Samari in that book. Um, but by writing towards him, it, it gave me a, a person, it gave me a reader who I deeply, deeply cared about. And because of that, that, that focused the energy of the writing in a very, very particular way. It angled it, it made it very, very specific, it streamlined it, I knew exactly who I was talking to. And so ultimately it was the thing that you know, it made, made the book possible. Yeah. So I, I'd love for you to read um, a passage for <coughs> us, if you would. And this one is about a, a rather pivotal event that took place in your life. You were 11 years old, living in Baltimore. And, um, and so this was one of those moments that you never forget. Um, I've marked off this little section and okay. we'd love to hear you read it in your, in your voice. Okay. Uh, f fear is a, um, uh, fear, fear is just such a, a, a strong component. Um, I'm gonna start a little bit early. I'm gonna start sure. beginning. Wherever you like. Okay. It's a strong component in this book. And this is, uh, you know, the moment when uh, the fear really crystallized for me. I was 11 years old standing out in the parking lot in front of the 7-Eleven, watching a crew of older boys standing near the street. They yelled and gestured at who? Another boy, young like me, who stood there almost smiling, gamely throwing up his hands. He had already learned the lesson he would teach me that day, that his body was in constant jeopardy. Who knows what brought him to that knowledge? The projects, a drunken stepfather, an older brother concussed by the police, a cousin pinned in the city jail. That he was outnumbered did not matter because the whole world had outnumbered him long ago, and what do numbers matter? This was a war for the possession of his body, and that would be the war of his whole life. I stood there for some seconds, marveling at the older boy's beautiful sense of fashion. They all wore ski jackets, the kind which, in my day, mothers put on layaway in September, then piled up overtime hours so as to have the thing wrapped and ready for Christmas. I focused in on a light-skinned boy with a long head and small eyes. He was scowling at another boy who was standing close to me. It was just before three in the afternoon. I was in the sixth grade. School had just let out and it was not yet the fighting weather of early spring. What was the exact problem here? Who could know? The boy with the small eyes reached into his jacket and pulled out a gun. I recall it in the slowest motion as though in a dream. There the boy stood with the gun brandished, which he slowly untucked, tucked, and then untucked once more, and in his small eyes I saw a surging rage that could, in an instant, erase my body. That was 1986. That year I felt myself to be drowning in the news reports of murder. I was aware that these murders very often did not land upon the intended targets, but fell upon great aunts, PTA mothers, overtime uncles, and joyful children, fell upon them random and relentless, like great sheets of rain. I knew this in theory, but could not understand it in fact until the boy with the small eyes stood across from me holding my entire body in his small hands. The boy did not shoot. His friends pulled him back. He did not need to shoot. He had affirmed my place in the order of things. He had let it be known how easily I could be selected. 
I took the subway home that day, processing the episode all alone. I did not tell my parents. I did not tell my teachers. And if I told my friends, I would have done so with all the excitement needed to obscure the fear that came over me in that moment. I remember being amazed that death could so easily rise up from nothing of a boyish afternoon, billow up like the fog. I knew that best West Baltimore, where I lived, that the north side of Philadelphia, where my cousins lived, that the south side of Chicago, where the friends of my father lived, comprised a world apart. Somewhere out there, beyond the firmament, past the asteroid belt, there were other worlds where children did not regularly fear for their bodies. Mm, thank you. <clears throat> So that is a theme that runs through the book, this, this theme of the endangerment of the black body. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in my other job, my main job, I'm a journalist. And I, you know, I, this book came out of, out of a sense of frustration with the craft of journalism. Um, because I, I spend a lot of time with like facts and figures and numbers. And, and I think um, while, while you need those tools to, to understand uh, social forces in this country, those tools can also obscure things. Um, they can blind you to the fact of individual lives. And so when I went to write Between the World and Me, the most important thing was that I, I make this tactile, that I make it hot, that you be able to feel it. That really is the job of literature, for you to be able to feel the thing and identify it. I, I didn't want it to be a, um, an intellectual exercise. I, you know, I do that in my regular job. I wanted it to be an emotional exercise. Um, I had written an article called The Case for Reparations for the Atlantic, and one of the big theories in that article was that the, the great theme, the relationship between African Americans and their, and their country since the time they arrived, since the time we arrived, uh, enslaved in 1619 up through today, was plunder. That plunder was how we should understand enslavement. That plunder was how we should understand the era of Jim Crow. That plunder is how you should understand the era of redlining. That plunder is even how you should understand the era of mass incarceration. But after having done that and having written that article, I was left kind of cold because I was wondering, but how does it feel for an individual person to live in that sort of way? And that was one of the big you know, reasons for writing Between the World and Me. So you just mentioned the piece that you wrote on reparations, uh, which got a lot of attention. Talk about that, about what those reparations might look like mm -hmm. in your view. H how would that play out and what might they accomplish? Well, you know, I, I think, um, well, first let's, let's go to the case, which, um, you know, has been controversial and you say reparations and people go, you know. <laughs> um, and, and the argument I'm making in a piece of reparations is not controversial at all. You know, first of all, we have a, country, we have a, a history in this country of giving reparations. It's not a foreign concept. Um, during the uh, Second World War, we imprisoned uh, a number of Japanese American citizens of this country. Um, and we did it under, you know, the suspicion that they might, you know, somehow uh, collaborate with our enemies. Um, Ronald Reagan signed legislation to give reparations to Japanese Americans who were interned. There was an injury that they had incurred that was unjust, and we decided to pay them for that. Um, with, with the exception of Native Americans, uh, you know, I really cannot think of a, another class in this country uh, who have suffered repeated injury to the benefit of other people uh, th than African Americans. Um, that injury is not incidental. That injury is not a misunderstanding. That injury is the direct result of policy. 250 years in, of, uh, of slavery in this country was not incidental, it wasn't a mistake, it wasn't a byproduct of American freedom, it is the basis of American freedom. The onset of the Civil War, the amount of wealth uh, that the four million African Americans enslaved in our southern states represented was more wealth than all the banks, all the railroads, all the productive capacity that this country put together. It was less than the four million black folks who were enslaved. If you wanted to go find um, the area, you wanted uh, uh, to look for the largest concentration of multimillionaires in this country, highest per capita, you would not come here to Philadelphia in 1860, you would not go to New York, you would not go to Boston or Chicago, you would go to the Mississippi River Valley, where you would see multimillionaires who had made their money through the exploitation of black bodies. And we who live here in the North are not exempt from this. In fact, in 1860, right before we go into the Civil War, 60% of our exports, America's exports, not Southern exports, American exports, are cotton products. 
That was how we built our wealth. Trying to imagine America separate from that wealth is impossible. Now, now when I wrote the article, that, that's slavery right there. But when I wrote the article, I, I didn't even focus on slavery. What I focused on was how we built our modern middle class. And the way we did it was through a program of social engineering. Uh, during the, uh, ninth, the late 1930s and then into the 1940s, during the New Deal, we had a series of programs that allowed for certain people in this country to purchase home loans. I'm sorry, to purchase homes. And the way we did it was we subsidized home loans for those people. We did it through the FHA. We did it through the GI Bill, HOLC. We had all these programs for folks. The suburbs that ring all of our major cities, the Levitt towns that we have, they did not spring up by magic. It was subsidized through federal tax money that African Americans paid into. But there was only one group that was exempt from those programs, and that group was African Americans. And through a program of redlining, which meant that if an African American moved onto your block, your block is automatically not ineligible for those government-backed loans. Through that program, black people were cut out of the largest wealth-building opportunity perhaps in American history. That was policy. And when you understand how it was passed, when you understand uh, uh, the politics of that time, it is a Democratic administration that passed, and the only way it was going to get passed, and this is true, by the way, for the rest of the New Deal programs, too, for Social Security, unemployment, et cetera. The only way it was going to get passed, the only way you could get Southern support, the support of the Solid South, was to cut black people out. And that's what happened. You wouldn't have the programs any other way. Now, this whole time, black people are holding up their end of the social contract. They're paying their taxes. They're obeying the laws. They're being, you know, uh, uh, um, holding up their end of the citizenship bargain. But they're not getting the same rewards back. In my estimation, that's plunder. If I am living in Mississippi in 1920, and I'm paying my taxes like everybody else, and you are using my tax money to uh, uh, subsidize, to erect, uh, 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 to take care of a public university system that I can't attend, that is plunder. You're taking from me to do something that I can't actually utilize. If you're taking my tax dollars and you're uh, using it to subsidize a public library system that I can't borrow books from, that is plunder. You've taken from me. You've caused me some sort of injury. If you're taking care of a park system that is segregated, a pool system that's segregated, if you're using my money for the benefit of other people, you are plundering me. That is the theme of the relationship uh, of African Americans to their government and their society, such that at this point in history, for every five cents of wealth that African Americans have, African American families have, white families have a dollar. That's the result of policy. That's not magic. And so we have a notion in, in our head that somehow we can fix that gap without actually giving any of the money back, <laughs> without investing in it. We spent all this time taking. <laughs> but somehow the problem is going to disappear without us giving back. Reparation is the argument that there is, in fact, an injury, that we have a policy of injuring black people. And the way to reverse that, the way to reverse that wealth gap, the way to bring us to equality is to give some of that money back. Now, you asked about you know, how, how that could be done. It could be done any number of ways. I, you know, in my story, I led with a gentleman by the name of Clyde Ross, Clyde Ross, who was directly injured by housing policy. People say people do reparations are dead. They are not dead. Plenty of them are around walking right now. Um, Clyde Ross deserves a check, period. He was, de he was deprived of the right to uh, 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 acquire a loan like everybody else. His neighborhood was plundered as a result. He deserves a check. But it doesn't even have to end just with checks. You know, it may be a situation in which, you know, I'm a little biased here, <laughs> but we, we, you know, direct resources to historically black colleges. You know, it may be a situation where African Americans are, <laughs> yeah. I told you, I'm a little biased because I went to Howard. That's <laughs> Oh, bias there. You know, it, it may be, you know, a situation in which folks are allowed to, uh, you know, just attend or achieve higher education for a number of years, you know, and not have to pay this, the same way. You know, it could be any number of programs, but I don't think that's the obstacle. I think the obstacle is getting people to own up to the debt in the first place. You see, if you can get people to own up to the debt, then, you know, we'll at least make an effort. We'll at least make an effort to do something. In that piece, you quoted our own Mayor Michael Nutter, and, and the context of the quote, as I recall, was talking about the idea that some people hold that black people need to just get it together and get on with it. That right. these, you know, cultural issues, these social <coughs> ills, um, these pathologies, as you um, said in the article, are something that, you know, black people need to just get it together and get on with it. And then you quoted the mayor um, saying, you know, to young people, pull your pants up, get a belt, you know, nobody wants to see you behind, right. that sort right. of thing. 
Talk about that. Well, I don't, I don't want to see you behind. I'm, <laughs> I'm okay with that. I'm okay with pulling your pants. I'm putting the belt on and, you know, dressing appropriately when you, when you go to a job interview. I have no problem, you know, with the message of moral uplift. That's the message I give to my son. I'm, I'm not upset with that. I am saying that as an as um, explanation for why we have a 20 to 1 wealth gap, that falls short. Um, that's my point. That's why I have nothing wrong with, you know, telling young people to do, you know, as I say, that's the message I get on my side. You know, but that's not an explanation, you know, for why, you know, he has to deal with the stuff that's written in the book. It, it's just not. Um, I think all people spell, uh, struggle with moral issues. I think all communities struggle with moral issues. There is um, nothing um, particular about the African American, uh, African American community that I've seen that makes me feel like the community struggles any more than any other community. Um, my message to black people has always been, you know, quite simple to the extent that I have one to deliver. I should say what I've learned from black people is actually quite simple. There really is nothing wrong with African Americans that the total and complete elimination of white supremacy would not fix. If we get the boot off our neck, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Should you take care of your kids? Yeah, you should. Everybody should. You know what I mean? Should you pay attention to school? Yeah, you should. You know, should you dress appropriately and do the things that you need to do when you go on a job? Yes, you should. But that has limited explanatory power when you compare it to the long history of plunder in this country. Well, and, and let me just follow up with that, um, because you write about you know, criminality, about so many of the issues that tend to plague the African-American community disproportionately. Mm -hmm. Are we, as African-Americans, to some degree culpable in, in, in some of the problems that we face? Do we have some culpability in the issues that we struggle with? I just don't think so. I just, I just don't, you know. Um, when, you, when, you, when you look at the weight, you know, I mean, I, 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 we have been free in this country for 150 years. We were enslaved for 250 years. And let's just give that up. Let's not even, talk. I mean, I just mentioned that, but that's not, it's not like after slavery, people were like, okay, go on your merry way and proceed to be happy. <laughs> that, that's not what happened. <laughs> What happened was we got the longest, most lethalist domestic terrorist campaign in American history. That, that was the reward. That was what you came out of slavery. And, and the people who, you know, suffered through at least the tail end of that are still alive. Like, they're with us. That's not like distant memory. It didn't happen a long time ago. And then after that happened, you know, um, we looked at, you know, and I've been writing about this recently. You know, we, we looked in our cities and we saw, you know, a, a rising crime. And crime was rising internationally. People don't tend to know that, but crime is rising internationally. The patterns that you saw in America are not particularly distinct. But the answer that America gave to that problem was a program of massive incarceration. Um, I, I just, and by the way, we're gonna be dealing with that for like, like decades. You know, there's a current consensus right now that says that this, this can be easily remedied. It cannot be easily remedied. We, um, America's incarceration rate in 1970, it was somewhere on the order of about 150 per 100,000. That's about mm -hmm. the norm for Western Europe. Um, America's incarceration rate right now is 700 per 100,000. We are a, a gigantic outlier in the Western world. The incarceration rate for African-American men is something like 4,000 per 100,000. One in three African-American men in this country will eventually spend some time in prison. African-American men who are high school dropouts have a 60% chance of eventually spending some sort of time in prison. That's the result of policy. We made decisions, you know? And so um, if you believe the black community has the capability to be superhuman, then yes, we have some culpability. You know, if you believe that, you know, ultimately, you know, we are, you know, a race of supermen and superwomen, and yeah, we, we, have, we have some culpability. But if we are humans, like everybody else in this country, if we are humans, like everybody else in this country who's been advantaged repeatedly by policy over us, then no. Then no. No more so than the Japanese Americans had culpability for their internment. No more so than the Native Americans had culpability for the theft of their land. No more so than any other, you know, group of people, you know, who've had genocide practiced against them. No, I, I just, I, I, can't, I can't buy that. You make a statement in the, in the book, I'm going to ask you to unpack it a little bit. It says, white America, in quotes, is a syndicate arrayed to protect its exclusive power to dominate and control our bodies. Sometimes this power is direct, lynching, Sometimes it is insidious, redlining, but however it appears, the power of domination and exclusion 
is central to the belief in being white. And without it, white people, quote unquote, would cease to exist for want of reason. Right, right. That, that's not, um, I, I, I love that idea, and I would love to take credit, but that's James Baldwin from the Fire Next Time. That's, that's, <laughs> that's what he said. I mean, seriously, that's channeling. And I'm not ducking the argument. I'll gladly have an argument, but I just, because I think the argument's right. I just don't want to take credit for it. But it, it is essentially correct. And, and what you have to get here is um, there is no consistent notion and Joel, I don't remember, know if you remember this, but I'm thinking like black folk here and there, like back in the day, us reading that. Um, <laughs> there, there is no um, consistent definition of, of, of white people across time and history. And there's no, really no consistent definition of black people across time and history. Um, we have a theory of race in this country which says that there is a pure group of people called black people who originate in Africa and you know, were brought to America. A pure group of people called white people who were brought to, you know, who came to this country, weren't brought, came to this country. Uh, a pure group of, you know, a group of people called Asian Americans, maybe who came here. A pure group of Native Americans who are here. Uh, and now it even looks like a pure, you know, race of Hispanics and Latinos. We've made that decision now. You know, who are themselves now a race. But see, we've made a decision. And that's not unique to them. I mean, that, that's what we do. We, we make decisions about people. And so if, you know, I were somewhere, you know, in Louisiana, in, I don't know, 1810, I might or might not be classified as black. I might be classified as an octoroon or all, you know, a whole list of other things that someone might call me. If I went to Brazil, I might have to check some, you know, entirely different box. We know that uh, when <coughs> Italians came here, when Irish folks came here, when Jews came here, they were not initially hailed and welcomed in as white people. It was a process of them becoming white. You, you can see this in the history when you look at, like, um, the laws from the time black folks first get here as slaves in 1619, you see like great rates of intermarriage and folks having children together between enslaved black people and uh, whites who are in indentured servants. This notion of, of race, of being biologically distinct and that being the ultimate thing that matters did not really exist until it became an interest that was needed to make it exist. <clears throat> and that interest became manifest through slavery. So when we talk about white America, the thing to understand is you are not talking about a group of fair-skinned people, per se. That's not, that's not really what you're talking about. You're talking about a definition that was erected to maintain power. That is just the history. That is, that's where the definition of white and out from, you know, one drop rule, all that comes about whose bodies are we going to possess and exploit and whose bodies will we not be able to possess and exploit. And without that power, what is there? I mean, seriously, what, what, what is there to, to white? And I'm, and I'm happy to engage an argument on that. You know, I would love to hear, hear what it is, you know. That, I think, is the key or one of the key problems, you know, in terms of, you know, having a conversation about race. You, you have so much to lose here, including your very name. Because I, I just, I, just I, I, I don't see what it is besides that. You talk about power, you talk about exploitation of bodies. We have to talk about the police shootings. Um, certainly this past year in particular, it seemed that every day, um, and, and it's not to say that it's not happening every day, but we were hearing about it every day. Um, how well are we addressing that issue at this point? We're talking about body cameras and, and taking some measures to address that, but how well are we doing in that regard? We're doing okay. Um, we're doing okay. Um, we, we could be doing better. I, I, I don't like the incessant focus on police and police violence. You know, um, I think it misses the point. Um, the, the example I always think about is, is Freddie Gray. Uh, you know, in my hometown, um, Freddie Gray was, 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 uh, lived in the Gilmore homes where my mother was raised. Um, I think about like, like what led to his arrest in the first place. And basically what Freddie Gray did was well, first of all, let's take it back even, even further than that. You know, Freddie Gray suffered intense, you know, he suffered from lead poisoning. And anybody that knows anything about Baltimore, any of our cities, we, we know who disproportionately suffers from lead poisoning and who does not. So right, right out the gate, you know, he's, he's, you know, in the hole. He is out doing whatever he's doing. And by the testimony of the police officer, he looks at the police officer and looks kind of suspicious and then runs. And because he runs, that, that becomes an arrestable offense. That precipitates everything. Now, now, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, looking at a police officer and running is not a crime. It's just not. I mean, if you arrested that, that people would say that's ridiculous. But Gilmore Homes in that area of West Baltimore has been designated a high drug trafficking zone. 
And that means that people can be arrested for things that they can't be arrested elsewhere. That is a policy choice. That you know, does not begin with the officer needing sensitivity training. That doesn't begin with the officer needing a body. That begins with the policy choice. It's a, and it's a drug issue. It's not a violence issue. It's not a gun issue. That's not why they're doing it. It's because of the drugs. You know? Um, and in almost all of these cases, you know, where you see somebody, you know, dying, you know, in, in this sort of way, there's usually some other issue behind it. At time at the time, I just find myself, why, why was there any contact between the police officer and the person? There was a guy, I think it was in Cincinnati where, where, uh, where the brother was shot, and um, it was the University of Cincinnati police who pulled him over for something stupid. I, I can't even remember. Why was there even any contact? To begin, what was the policy that led to the contact in the first place? You know, and that we have trouble talking about because, see, that, that indicts us. The policy, we live in a democracy here in America. The policy is democratic. It's been passed by a group of people. It's not just the police who you can point to anymore. You know, we bear culpability in that. You mentioned um, your friend, Prince Jones, um, whose mom is here with us tonight, his family. And um, he was shot by an African-American police officer. Um, in circumstances, as you just described, that you that raise the question, how do these two even come together? Right, right. Talk about that. Well, again, I mean, I, you know, we focus on that, but again, I, I just think that that misses the point. That, 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 that the thing I go back to, so just to, you know, tell the entire story, um, this is the second week of the time, I'm be telling this story for six weeks. Um, Prince was uh, in, in, in Prince George's County. The police officer, this is it's just a comedy of, it's in, in a, a tragic comedy of errors. The police officer um, had come in that day and he was supposed to work undercover and you know, had dressed like a drug dealer, okay? He ran into somebody else, some other officer out in PG County whose gun had got stolen by some criminal, suspected the gun had been stolen by some suspected criminal. The one guy recruits the guy who's, who's uh, dressed like a drug dealer and says to him, all right, you come with me, we're going to go find this guy who I think stole the gun. This is all legal, by the way. I mean, this is, this is all legal. These guys are not you know, in any sort of rogue operation, at least you know, not by the judgment of the, of the authorities. They go out looking for this guy. They see a Jeep that match, they think matches the description of this other guy's Jeep. They run the tags on the Jeep, and they come back here to, uh, to Pennsylvania to Mabel Jones. They don't, you know, it never occurs to them that, you know, maybe that's somebody's kid. It never occurs to them, maybe, you know, Prince is a, you know, a, a member of the family. They think the Jeep is stolen. They decide to fight. And there's no, like, like, this is not a murderer that we're talking about. You know, this is not, you know, some, you know, sort of prolific drug pen. That's not what they're investigating. They follow this, uh, they follow Prince from Prince George's County, which is just outside of D.C., through D.C., into Virginia, one of the officers says he gets lost or something, and Prince, and this is by the officer's testimony, because I don't know what happened. I mean, there's, no, there, there's plenty of reason not to trust this guy's testimony, but this is his testimony. They somehow end up cornered somewhere. He says Prince backs his car into him, and he ends up you know, sh shooting Prince to death. Now, here's what I think about. Even buying that officer's version, even buying it, here's what I think about. I think about myself, you know, driving to, to see my fiance, and I, and I think about it, you know, being that late at night. And I think about looking into my rearview mirror and seeing somebody intentionally dressed like a drug dealer, tracking me. By the officer's own testimony, he never produced a badge or anything. And I, and I, I think about that, and, and even by his testimony, I think I, I can't separate myself from that. Now you see, there were a series of decisions that were made, and it doesn't matter that the police officer was black. I just can't imagine that if that was a Jeep and it was somebody white in that Jeep, that they wouldn't have called that off. The entire suspicion that he must be a criminal is rooted in our skepticism of black people and the belief that uh, he probably is a criminal anyway, even though the tags don't match who I think I'm looking for. The gentleman who, who shot Prince Jones was not prosecuted. He wasn't even fired from the police force. They found out later that he had lied in all of these other cases and they had to drop the cases against the people that had been convicted. They had to let the cases go because of this officer. They welcomed him right back to the police force. I just... I mean, that burned me so much, yeah. you know? And I think like, it must have been like maybe a month before Prince died, my own son was born. So I got this kid with me, you know, who is my job to protect. And I just have seen this situation where this friend of mine, who was the best to us, I mean, just 
got shot down in the worst possible way. How does that leave you thinking about your kid? How does that leave you thinking about your country, about your world? No justice, no nothing. Just move on. Oh, well, sorry. Not even a sorry. Oh, well, take it. Your son is a teenager now. He's 15, yeah. What do you tell him about dealing with law enforcement, about how to carry himself in the world? I tell him, be watchful. Um, I tell him, be watchful. You know, um, we have not had like a, a, a single talk. That's not how it, how it went in our house. Um, we have been having many, many talks, mm -hmm. you know, for a long time. You know, I talked to him about how he walks through the neighborhood. You know, um, I talked to him about how he, you know, in, in, interacts with police. I've always talked to him about that. But I have to tell you, that kind of leaves me hollow because the lesson I got, and I've told him this, the lesson I got from Prince, lesson I got from Tamir Rice, the lesson you know, I, I got from Walter Scott, the lesson I got from Eric Garner, is that that got nothing to do with nothing. That ain't gonna save you. That ain't gonna save you. And when folks decide you know, that you are uh, um, dangerous enough, or not even dangerous enough, when they feel themselves threatened and they decide to deal with you in a certain way, you know, there's really nothing you can say. You know? Um, that, that, that is just the fact of it. You know, I, I fear for him. You know, I fear for him in, in, in a violent way. And I don't, again, I don't want to focus on the police. I don't fear for him because of the police. I fear for him because we have had policies in this country that have made African-American communities a lot more dangerous and a lot more violent than other communities. One more question regarding police. And this is a statement that you make in the book that, again, I'd like you to talk about. Um, you're talking about the night of 9-11, mm -hmm. and you are on the roof of an apartment building with your wife and some friends, and you're watching Manhattan just go up in flames, and, and you write, I could see no difference between the officer who killed Prince Jones and the police who died, or the firefighters who died. They were not human to me, black, white, or whatever. They were the menaces of nature. They were the fire, the comet, the storm, which could, with no justification, shatter my body. There are those who would read that and, and find that harsh. There are many people, um, African American and otherwise, who would view those uh, law enforcement officials as heroes that day, and yet you say, that made no difference to me. Well, um, I found it harsh when I read that Prince Jones had been killed. I found that harsh. And um, my, my sense was that um, th the rest of the world did not you know, sh share that feeling. Um, that was a year after Prince had died. And I just, I couldn't believe no one had done anything. Like I couldn't believe like, that, that folks were just gonna be like, mosey on, keep on here. And I, I, I see all of that, I saw all of the commemoration for the folks who had died during 9-11. And I saw the country, you know, go into this, this great national mourning, you know, for, for a crime of terrorism. And I just kept thinking about, and not even just about Prince, but how so many folks, you know, <clears throat> had died, how it was our lot, in fact, as a community, to see people die as a result of a kind of terrorism that, you know, extends back, way, way back into American history. And we're supposed to take that. You know, we're just supposed to say, mm, okay, and go pull your pants up, keep going. That's like, you know, how folks deal with us. And so, I was so angry. I was just so, so pissed off and so angry. I, I just felt cold. I had no capacity at that point in time for sympathy at all. Yeah. Um, that is not correct. That is not right. That is not a logical argument. Um, every human being, you know, who dies is an individual. Uh, is an individual with their own loves, their own, you know, foibles, grandmothers, grandfathers, you know, uh, mothers, fathers, daughters, sisters, lovers, wh whatever. They are individual humans, neighbors. I could, I just, man, I, I couldn't see any of it at the moment, mm -hmm. though. I, I was so, you know, just so angry. Yeah. Have your views changed over time? Yeah, they did. They did. Um, you know, you, you grow, you get a little older. I was... Um, I guess 25 right then, um, you, you get a little older. Um, you, you begin to understand that um, saying that this person's life matters 
cannot in any sort of just way be said if you're gonna make it conditional. You know, you can't say this person's life only matters if you say this person over here's life matters. The, the, the people who you have uh, a dispute with, the people who you are angry at, the people who you have beef with, they can't be your standard. You know, see, because that's what happens. You say, well, I will only do this if you do this, and then you make the folks you object to your standard. Mm -hmm. And that, 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 could not, uh, that could not be my standard. Yeah. I'd love for you to read one more passage <clears throat> from the book before we um, open the floor to the audience for your questions tonight. Um, you write at some length about your experiences at Howard, uh, at the Mecca, mm -hmm. and uh, about the yard uh, in particular. And I'd love if you would just read us a little bit of that, just to give us a feel for what your sure. experience was like there. And again, um, well, I chose the part at the bottom of that page, but you start wherever you like. Okay. Um, <clears throat> people say there's no hope in this book. All the hope is at Howard. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hope in this book. <laughs> Y'all got to intrude. <laughs> Who asked you? <laughs> you get your own time. Write your own book, and then you come up here and talk about spell, man. <laughs> spell, man. <laughs> Y'all all right. <laughs> no, I love all HBCUs. I'm joking. I first witnessed this power out on the yard, that communal green space in the center of the campus where the students gathered, and I saw everything I knew of my black self multiplied into seemingly endless variations. There was this, this I do not know how to say this word, scions, scions, scions? Scion, I think, scions. Right? <laughs> Somebody out here knows. <laughs> I had to do the audio book, and they had to tell me like five times. You just times. write it, you don't I have to say it, right? <laughs> But you know what, that's how you can tell like an autodidact because you don't know how to pronounce words. Like you haven't gotten them from other people saying them to you. You've only read them, you know, and that's me. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> there were the scions of Nigerian aristocrats in their business suits giving dap to bald-headed cues in purple windbreakers and tan timberlands. There were the high yellow progeny of AME preachers debating the clerks of a saw set. There were California girls turned Muslim, born anew in hijab and long skirt. There were Ponzi schemers and Christian cultists, tabernacle fanatics and mathematical geniuses. <clears throat> it was like listening to a hundred different renditions of redemption song, each in a different color and key. And overlaying all of this was the history of Howard itself. I knew that I was literally walking in the footsteps of all the Toni Morrisons and Zora Neale Hurstons, of all the Sterling Browns and Kenneth Clarks who'd come before. The Mecca, the vastness of black people across space-time, could be experienced in a 20-minute walk across campus. I saw this vastness in the students chopping it up in front of the Frederick Douglass Memorial Hall where Muhammad Ali had addressed their fathers and mothers in defiance of the Vietnam War. I saw its epic sweep in the students next to Ira Aldrich's theater where Donny Hathaway had once sung, where Donald Byrd had once assembled his flock. The students came out with their saxophones, trumpets, and drums, played my favorite things, or someday my prince will come. Some of the other students were out on the grass in front of Elaine Lock Hall in pink and green, chanting, singing, stomping, clapping, stepping. Some of them came up from Tubman Quadrangle with their roommates and rope for double dutch. Some of them came down from Drew Hall with their caps cocked and their backpacks slung with one arm, then fell into gorgeous ciphers of beatbox and rhyme. Some of the girls sat by the flagpole with bell hooks and Sonia Sanchez in their straw totes. Some of the boys with their new Yoruba names beseeched these girls by citing fans for known. Some of them studied Russian. Some of them worked in bone labs. They were Panamanian. They were Bayesian. And some of them were from places I had never heard of but all of them were hot and incredible, exotic even, that we held from the same tribe. Mm. <laughs> Anahasi, thank you for coming. Um, I'm really glad you're reading the audio book. <laughs> um, but my way of getting to meet you was through the interview you did with Charlie Rose. And he asked you a question about the, you get into the conversation about the tools of writing versus the message. And I guess I would love to hear you talk a little more about 
how just the process of writing fits in your life and, and with the message. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, it's hard. It's very, very hard to write. Um, well, I, I guess the best way to think about this is, is to talk about Between the World and Me, because um, you have an object lesson. Um, I had a series of experiences, you know, stretching back, you know, to the time I was a child that I could not process and could not understand it. I had been trying for much of my life to understand. Um, I had a, an incident with a friend from Howard University that I was struggling with emotionally, trying to understand. <clears throat> and that was always going on in the back of my head somewhere. I had Howard University, which I always wanted to write about in some sort of way. I knew that that had been like just a, um, an important experience for me. And I, um, for some reason, and I, and I don't know why, I don't know if it was just the time, but somewhere around, I guess about 2012, 2013, um, I, I went back and I read uh, James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. And I was just stunned. You know, I had, I, I, and I had read it for the first time when I was, you know, probably about 19 years old. I sat up and found this library, and I read the whole thing in one sitting. And <clears throat> while I knew I had read something incredible, I, 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 I didn't understand what had happened, actually. I didn't really understand most of what was going on uh, when I read the book. But this time, I, like, I got it. I could see it. And I was just blown away. And I think, like, a lot of people talk about Baldwin, and they talk about his political insight, which is there and which is true and which is real, but the writing is just, good God. I mean, you're, you're talking, as far as I'm concerned, you know, our finest essayists. I mean, right there. I mean, just, and to have something important to say about the world and to marry that, you know, to just such a, a fierce, fierce pen, you know, I, I just thought that that was everything. And when I was done, Call my agent up. My agent has been around for a while. She's, you know, just been a, an, an advisor to me. And I called up and I said, I said, I said, Gloria, how come no one writes like this anymore? <laughs> and she said, you know, my, my agent knew James Baldwin. She said, well, 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 Jimmy, Jimmy was one of a kind. That was Jimmy. Jimmy did that. Only Jimmy could do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I got that. I said, I got that. And I said, but what, you know, you think about it even just as a book package, you know, you don't really see people just taking, you know, in a thin sort of book, just making an argument and just, you know, going hard at it like that. She said, yeah, no, you don't. And I said, do you think somebody could do that today? And she said, well, I, I think you could try. <laughs> so I think you could try. <laughs> so I tried. And that is Gloria. <laughs> so, so I tried. And uh, my first try was not very successful. Um, I sent it to my audience. He said, oh, that's OK. You know, you need to go write it again. <laughs> I wrote it again. And I sent it back. He said, that's a little better, but that's not it. And I tried again. And I sent it to him. He said, OK, I think we got something. But I don't know what this book is about. I don't know what's going on here. And I said, I, I, I don't know either. But there was a paragraph deep in it. You know, most of what I wrote is not in this book. You know, that's, that's like when I talk about it being hard, that's where it is. Um, but there was a paragraph about the body that I had written. It was just one paragraph at that point. I said, God, I think that's it. I think everything should build out from here. So I tried it again. And he said, OK, that, that's, that's kind of close. So I went and I printed it out. And I actually have this. I still have this. And I, I printed the whole thing out. And I tried to think of, you know, one, one of the techniques that, that you know, an editor at the New Yorker told me many, many years ago was if, if it's not working, just put everything in order. Just put everything in order and then see what happens after that. It might not be right, but just go from beginning to end. Why don't you try that? And so I, I put everything in order that I had in the book beginning to end. I went through the whole thing, marked it where it was, and then I came up with a structure, and I came up with what I thought every paragraph should go, and I typed every paragraph in again into the computer where it was just to run it through my brain one more time, to shop and shop and shop and shop and shop. And, shop. and then I had a book. Then, then I finally had, had, a, had a draft that, okay, this looks like it's something. And, you know, you just kept working it. You know, I'm, I'm not, and, and, you know, maybe Baldwin was like this. I don't know. Maybe there are writers out there who, who are like this. I don't know. Um, but I am certainly not a writer who it, it just comes to. You know, I, it just doesn't work like that. You know, um, it is, uh, the, the writing is the revision over and over and over and over again. And, you know, in the times I've taught writing classes, I, you know, I always tell people that I don't, I don't think, 
The problem with writing is talent. I think that you know, enough people who are born with the talent to write, but what they can't do is face the horribleness of themselves. <laughs> That's what they can't do. They just, they just can't. You know, they write something, they say, oh my God, I'm terrible, and then that's it, I quit. <laughs> I don't want anything to do with this ever again. Because <laughs> I'll never get good, it's clear. But in fact, that's a phase that most writers I know go through. And the difference between the writers and those who don't is that they can actually take it, go back, and hit it again, hit it again. I am dying to know what is going to be your approach to writing Black Panther. <laughs> <laughs> and I ask this because I'm the author of Black Comics, Politics of Race and Representation. Right. I wrote it at Howard. And what is your connection to comics? What is going to be your approach to writing Black Panther? Well, if I answered the, uh, the question about approach, I would have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't tell you. <laughs> Um, I, can't, I can't tell you anything. Um, uh, well, here's what I can say. Here's what I can say. So I got commissioned to write um, The Black Panther for, for Marvel. Uh, and I, I've loved comics since I was a, a child. I, I just, I, I do a comic. I was a huge Spider-Man, huge X-Men fan as a child. Um, and this was like, you know, some of my earliest introduction to the world of literature. I had a very pop culture introduction to, to literature. Um, Wakanda is like some sort of like pan-African dream because it is the most advanced country in the world. It's in the heart of Africa. It's never been conquered, anything like that. Um, but I think there's like a massive contradiction at, at the idea of Wakanda. And the contradiction is this. You have the most highly educated advanced populace in the world in this country, and they're ruled by a king. Um, And no one in any sort of just way has ever said anything about this. <laughs> so I just think somebody might say something about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can say. That's all. So that's my approach. <laughs> one of the things I really liked about the book, and I think you demonstrated it again very well this evening, is that for uh, someone like me, who our society would classify as white, I guess, uh, I was given a real sense of what it would be like to be in the shoes of someone who grew up in your uh, area, which would be classified by the society, again, as you told us, as African American. I'm wondering if in your education at Howard and thereafter, have you read writers who our society would classify as white, who gave you the feeling that you were in their shoes, both people that would be quite against where you're coming from and people classified as white who would be quite sympathetic and would uh, agree with where you're coming from. I appreciate the classified as white. I actually, I really appreciate that. I'm not being sarcastic. Um, of course, how can you not? I mean, you just, I mean, the book starts with this quote from, well, it doesn't start, I mean, but one of the central ideas, you know, from the book is from, you know, Saul Bellow, you know, and uh, his, you know, phrase, I was telling the kids about this uh, earlier today, who is the Tolstoy of, of, of the Zulus, you know, which is just a straight, you know, sort of racist statement. As a black person, you, you have to grapple with that. When I was, you know, a young man at Howard University and I, you know, had dreams of one day writing for magazines, I had to read magazines that published no black people. You know, I had to read issues of the New Republic, which I assure you at that point in time definitely <laughs> regularly said things that people, you know, who were like me, you know, who were classified as black would not have agreed with at all. I had, I'll never forget this. I mean, one of the most probably, you know, you talk about negative inspiration, one of the most, you know, example of negative inspiration, you know, for me is they ran an issue um, in, in the mid 90s where they exerted the bell curve and then they, they you know, just ran, they, you know, I guess they, they would qualify this as in their defense, but they ran a bunch of um, dissents. But see, the notion was that your intelligence is up for debate. That really is the thing. Now, here I am at Howard University, you know, and I'm surrounded by people who are just, you know, blowing my head off every day. And, you know, and here I'm picking up, you know, a magazine, you know, an instrument from the field that I, you know, hope to one day enter, and your intelligence is up for debate. You can't not, you know, when you're black, if you're going to be literate in any sort of way, you know, read people who uh, in some profound way doubt your humanity. And then you have to get past it. I mean, and you have to get past it in the sense that you have to 
take the lessons from the literature nonetheless. You have to learn how to write, you know, from folks, you know, nonetheless. You know, that's an ignorant statement by Saul Bellow. It does not, you know, excuse you from reading Saul Bellow. You know, I, I don't know what Fitzgerald's, you know, attitude towards black people was. I don't know what Hemingway's attitude towards black people was. I know I have a problem, though, when I read, you know, how he depicts, you know, his heroes, you know, his heroes, his protagonists in Africa. I know that that hits me in a certain kind of way. But I got to read it anyway. That's just the way it is. You know, I'm, I'm a student. I, 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 you know, I don't have the option of opting out. And see, this is the great difference between the black world and the white world. And more than it's a difference between the black world and the white world, it's the difference between having power and not having power. The people who don't have power have to learn the language of the other folks. They just have to. And this is not particular to black people. I'm sure, you know, from a, you know, the perspective of a woman, you can make the same statement. You simply don't have the option, if you're going to, you know, um, I don't know, even attempt to be prosperous of opting out of folks' language. You just, you just don't. I mean, you, you, you have to read people who, in some profound way, doubt your humanity. And you have to learn how they speak, and you have to, you know, learn to see the good <laughs> in what they say. I mean, this is a, you know, the, great, the Prince Jones example is just a great example. I have to, if I'm going to develop as a writer, come to some sort, of, and if I'm going to be, you know, prominent as a writer, I have to come to some sort of understanding of what 9-11 was, and I have to figure out some way to feel what this country felt. But there are plenty of folks who are writers who are at my level who do not have to investigate and figure out how I felt about Prince. They don't have to do that. I have to do that work. Um, and so I just, it, it, it's, a, it's a profound difference. I don't regret that. I don't lament that. You know, I think um, in some really, really deep way, the slave always understands the slave master in a way that the slave master cannot possibly understand the slave. Because the slave has to, just has to. It's a matter of, of you know, of, of survival. We don't have, you know, the option for ignorance. I'm in, uh, I, I'm in France for this year, right? And it is interesting to be a part of what folks would consider like the dominant tongue, English. So Americans can go to France and they can say, do you speak English? You know, and the French, you know, they get pissed off, but they got to deal with it. They have to deal with it because English is the dominant tongue. English is the thing. And they are much, much more likely, and they're, you know, they're, they're bad at it by European standards. There are many other countries that are better but they have to learn English. You know what I mean? We don't have to learn French. And, and, and seeing that, and seeing how that, that works, is fascinating. You know, it is, um, you know I, I try to speak my bad French with them, and they look at me bizarrely, but they don't look at me. It's actually, you know, you would think it's snobbery, but it's more like, why are you doing this? <laughs> like, why, why would you want to learn this? Like, what are you, why come over here? You know, you could just, you know, stumble your way through, you know, just speaking, you know, English. And that, that, that's about power. Hi, uh, I'm a Hi. teacher in the school district of Philadelphia, and I, I just want to thank you. I actually, oh, thanks. <laughs> it's a uh, friendly crowd here. That's great. Um, <laughs> so I just want to thank you so much for speaking to the kids today. Uh, we brought our students here. Um, they were was, great. Yeah, it was awesome. Great. I was sorry I got on whoever that was in the middle. I'm sorry about that. I was hard. No, it was, it was like awesome classroom management, right? <laughs> right. Incredible. Sorry. Um, and they so, apologize. You know, all of them came and said, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> um, and so in, like, walking out with my kids and asking them what stood out, um, what stood out to them and all of them was that he grew up like us, like they said. Mm -hmm. And it was a really powerful experience for them to hear you speak and to read your book and to get it signed. Um, and I think it's, it really it was impactful. So thanks so much for that. Um, and before coming, I shared with them what you wrote about your education experience in Baltimore, um, specifically talking about how you <laughs> loved some of your teachers, but you never really trusted mm -hmm. any of them or anything mm -hmm. that they said. Uh, and I'm just wondering, having grown to be someone who, you know, you essentially learn for a living, right? You learn for a living, you tell us what you learned. Um, is there anything that you feel like the schools could have done to engage you in that learning at an earlier age? I think, um One of the, the, the big problems when I came up was that um, I, I felt like the justification for education was, was corrupted at its root. Um, obviously, the, the concept of education, I, I don't, I, I'm obviously a fan of learning. Um, the community was so afraid. And so it was like, get your education so they don't send you to jail. Get your education so you don't end up on the corner. You know, get your education so that you don't end up dead. I mean, that was like the, the, the background 
justification for it. You know, do this, you know, or you'll end up like this. That, that is not like the incentive I use for learning now. That just, that, that has limited motivational power. There are beautiful things about learning. Um, I can remember being in a French class in seventh grade, and it was like, why am I here? Like, that's what I remember thinking. Why am I here? What use does this have? I don't know any French people. I know France exists theoretically <laughs> somewhere across the ocean. I'm not going to encounter those people. I don't know anything about them. You know, what, what use does this have in my world? And, and I just, I don't know, man. Had somebody said, or perhaps not even said, made manifest somehow. The idea that ta if you learn this, you can see like a world so far away from what you know here. And what you see in West Baltimore, this, this is not the world. This is not, you know, how everybody is. And listen, I had more exposure than most kids I knew. Like, I, I had parents who were educated and were interested in having me exposed to things. But I just, I couldn't connect the classroom with any broader thing. You know, it was not like, you know, learn, you know, geometry because this building that you see downtown was built this way. And if you master this, you might be able to do something cool like this one day. That wasn't how it was. And I, and I can't help but reflect on that. And think about how, you know, I started, I, you know, I started studying French about three years ago, right? But it was a very, very practical thing to me. You know, I, I understood then, at that point, you know, that, you know, it could give me interaction with a different, you know, uh, uh, part of the world, with a different culture. It had a, a, there was a thing to it. That was like the beautiful thing, always the beautiful thing about writing. Like, there was always a practical end to it. I could look at the end of my writing, feel a certain way, feel like I had gotten something out, feel better about myself. Um, I just... I, you know, I, I, I'm not teaching this year, but, you know, I, I, I was at, you know, CUNY last year, and I was at MIT the year before that, teaching writing, and I always began, especially at MIT, because I was dealing with, like, scientists and engineers, and I always felt, like, right off the bat, I had to justify why they were in that class, and I had to make it very, very clear to them what writing could do for them, I, you know, and that, that, I guess, would probably be my approach to education, like, you, you got to get the kid to enroll, you know, you can't, like, um, Enroll because I told you to enroll. I mean, I will lead. I mean, there's some kids that will do that, but I think what you get is a limited fill-in-the-blanks kind of knowledge, not a, you know, a, a love of learning, which I think teachers should be in the business of cultivating. When you talk about reparations, we are supposing that a system that has never respected the lives of black people, our dreams, our aspiration, would at some point in time acknowledge their responsibility and put in a financial system that would benefit the black people, which most black people think is totally unrealistic and would never happen. But might not reparations or a movement for reparations evolve as white people who understand the reality of white privilege begin to interact with Africans in America who are trying to rebuild their community and come together to, to put together systems that could empower our neighborhoods. Because right now, if we don't control the economic wealth of our communities, we don't really have communities. We're just people living in neighborhoods. Could you see reparations evolving in that fashion? Well, I think actually the, 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 first, <coughs> the, the, the first one you gave is actually correct. Um, I, I think that, that is, you put it very starkly, and I think that's true. Um, I hate saying this. I hate going through this. Um, the, the reason why we don't have economic power, you know, there are very, very good reasons for why we don't have economic power in our communities. Um, we have been and we continue to be deprived uh, of the kind of opportunities that other people um, receive. So let's just leave redlining in the past. Let's, let's, let's just leave that out. The housing crisis, well, let's start before that, the housing boom that happened in this country, you know, was an opportunity for many people to get access to homes. And yet, you know, we find, in, in, for instance, my city of Baltimore, banks took advantage <laughs> of the fact that African Americans, you know, some African Americans had some amount of savings and wealth, but had not had access traditionally to the loans. And so a company like Wells Fargo comes into Baltimore like it did and explicitly targets black people for subprime loans. Explicitly, directly. No, you know, your, it's not like, you know, your credit was different than white. No, they, they, the, 
The suit that later came, ran the numbers, found you balance for everything, everything about the community. Black folks are specifically targeted for those kinds of loans, specifically designed to extract wealth out of the community. And then they got like, <laughs> I mean, if that's not enough, you don't have the quantitative data, if that's not enough. They started like, you know, subpoenaing, subpoenaing the files. And they see like the, the employees, the folks that are doing the loans, referring to black people as mud people, referring to the loans as ghetto loans. Now, the thing that makes that possible in the first place is the segregation. You see, you have all your targets right there. Everything is on your side. And at the same time, at the same time, people who live in other communities are being given opportunities to buy homes on the up and up. And so what we've seen over the past few years is the wealth gap has actually expanded. The thumb of the state is on the scale for certain people. And it's a big, big thumb. So, you know, I, 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 I understand um, because I come from it, you know, to be honest. You know, I, I think if my dad would say he'd make an argument similar to yours, and this is an ongoing debate between, you know, us. There are limits to what black people can do by themselves. You know, we are a minority in this country. And state policy, you know, for most of our history has been tailored to disadvantage us. I don't know how you come to control the economy of your community when there are policies in place that actively present, that prevent that. When the tax dollars of other Americans are going to subsidize a system that actively prevent that. I, I don't know any other community that, that's done that. Now, the common response to that is folks compare us to other, you know, ethnic groups in this country and say, well, you know, folks have come to this country, they built up, they support their own X, Y, and Z. But see, that's not the whole story, actually. That's not the whole story. Again, those communities are often given access to loans that we have not been given access to. Those, you know, communities do not suffer from the kind of discrimination or the kind of segregation that we suffer from. And when I say segregation, I don't just mean not, you know, sitting on a bus next to white people. I mean the law actively being designed in such a way to put you in a position where you can be better exploited because that's, that's ultimately what it is. There's money on the other end of that. How do we get up from under that without a change in policy? And I know that's depressing, you know, and I know that that's not um, the most encouraging answer because the chances of any change in policy, certainly in my lifetime towards reparations, d does not look good. You know, I, I, I would very, very much, it's stock, man. It's really, really stark. Even in my son's lifetime, it's really, really stark. But when you're talking about a 20 to 1 wealth gap, when you're talking about, as we know, African American families that make somewhere around $100,000, which is doing pretty good in this country, living in neighborhoods that are similar to white families that make $30,000. You know, and I'm, I'm not pulling numbers out of, you know, I don't know. You can go read, like, I, I had all this in the case for reparations. Please go read this on the Atlantic website. You know, it's sourced in everything. When you're talking about, because I don't want you guys, you know, thinking I'm standing up here just pulling numbers out my backside, just throwing them at you. I'm not. I'm not. Um, when you talk about that kind of social, you know, distance, when you talk about that kind of exploitation, I, I don't know what else there is. I just don't. It's not a great answer. It's not a satisfying answer. It's not an answer that leaves you feeling, you know, okay, we're going to get up from under this tomorrow. Here's where it gets even, even deeper for me. When I think about moments of progress for African Americans in this country, always behind that is the specter of violence, okay? Enslavement in this country did not end because, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln and his allies decided, you know what, this slavery thing, it, it should go away. Now, they, they felt that way. They felt that way, but that wasn't why it ended. It ended because a radical group of secessionists in the South decided that they were going to erect an empire to protect slavery. And they were crazy and they were defeated and the result of that was the end of enslavement. But along the way, 600,000 Americans died. And towards the end of it, you know, you had black people, you know, recruited in the army doing violence. So slavery ends violently. That, that's what happened in this country. When you think about the civil rights movement, there's a tendency to, to focus on the protesters, which is, you know, fine. You know, there's great courage there that you see. But see, what, what I see is, is the specter of great violence. I see the shadow of World War II where you see folks, you know, uh, Americans seeing what racism looks like when it's taken to its natural end and what happens out of that. I see the Cold War and Bobby Kennedy not wanting to be embarrassed by the Freedom Riders. I see black people in the movement who, you know, who were killed. And so it strikes me that, you know, I've given, you know, some sort of prescription that says here is how we get out. But in terms of how it happens, I don't really see it happening until there's some sort of external threat. 
that makes it necessary. Because that's the history. That, 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 that really is the history. I, I hate saying that. I hate giving that answer. I would love to outline a political program which I think, you know, do X, Y, and Z, and, and it could work. But, you know, as a student of history, I, I don't... You know, I was reading this historian, Barbara Tushman, the other day, and she was saying, you know, um, people... It, it's rare that people admit their error, and even rarer that states admit their error. It just doesn't happen unless there's some sort of interest. You know, people, you know, use, uh, they say, well, well, look at Germany. Look at how, you know, the Germans remember. We could do that. We could do what the Germans do. Well, the Germans killed 90% of the Jews who were living there. That's how they got there. That's why they remember. And then they were defeated. That's how it happened. And so when you, you look at American history and you try to find, you know, or you look at human history, and you consider the case uh, of America, and you try to find some sort of way that's within our hands for it to end, I don't see it. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Thank you. I'm really honored. Um, I'll just start off with a little bit about me. I'm two years younger than you, and this year I just found out um, my connection to Africa. I found out that um, I'm descended from a slave named Tracy who was brought over here from what is now Cameroon. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to ask you about your lineage, how much do you know about um, your connection mm -hmm. to um, the people who were working on the plantation? Well, um, I know a little bit. You know, not, not too much. My dad's from Philadelphia. You know, my mom's from Baltimore. Um, I can, you know, trace my mother's side of family, like I said, over to the eastern shore of Maryland, where my folks have been for a long time. Um, I'm less interested in this question than a lot of other people and a lot of other black people, and I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, I feel myself to be very American, and I especially feel myself to be very American now that I'm abroad. Um, it's <laughs> obvious. <laughs> it's very, very obvious how, how, how American I, I in fact, am. I, I just, um, and, and I, I don't want to, you know, impugn in any way, your, you know, your own search, because I think each person has to decide, you know, whether... That's the thing. I wasn't right. Right. And I stumbled upon it. Right. Mm. Well, I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't want to impugn the, the importance, you know, um, for, for individual people. Let me put it like that. Um, I don't know. I guess I feel like I, I know my people, you know. Um, and, and, you know, I guess, you know, if I, you know, if somebody did the lineage for me, that, that could be interesting, you know. Um, but I, I know where the folks were from. I know where they were enslaved. Um, and I don't know why that's enough for me, but it is. Mm. Well, we could go on for a long time, but please join me as we thank Tanahazi thank Coates. Thank you. And thank special you. thanks to Sonia Sanchez for being thank with you. us tonight as thank well. You so much. Thank you. <laughs>